All right. So, um, welcome uh, again. And uh, before I get started, a couple of quick announcements. Uh, so first off, the uh, course sizes have changed quite a bit. The uh, TAs uh, have been re reapportioned according to the new uh, allocation. And so uh, just as a heads up, uh, Tang uh, Guan is no longer a TA for this class. Uh, so um, direct your emails to the other uh, two, t uh, two TAs, um, uh, Vishravas and uh, Sharanth. Um, the other two uh, course content TAs, the project TAs are unchanged. Um, OK. Checkpoint zero has been um, officially the, the date was uh, set at um, last Sunday, last Monday. Uh, I've added, uh, I've given people another uh, week or so to submit uh, for half credit. So if you have not yet submitted checkpoint zero, uh, please submit that uh, right away. Um, and when I say half credit, this really is a very minor component of your grade, uh, but it's important that you at least make sure that your system is working. Uh, so if you can't submit, I I'd like to know that now rather than uh, three weeks from now when the actual projects are due. OK. Um, checkpoint one, the first actual project has been posted. Um, it is intended to be a somewhat open-ended project, but uh, the lecture on Monday will outline basic evaluation strategies. And hopefully by the end of Monday, uh, we'll have gone over uh, this content to the point where uh, if you implement it according to uh, what we talk about on Monday, uh, you'll, be getting, you'll get at least a B plus on the, uh, on the overall uh, checkpoint one. And it shouldn't be too hard uh, to improve on that a little bit and get, uh, get a full A. Um, last thing is that homework one is due tonight. We'll be posting homework two in a, uh, either tonight or tomorrow night. Uh, if you have trouble logging into Timberlake, now would be the time. Uh, I would prefer to find out about this sooner rather than later. Um, the CSE submit information has been posted both on Piazza. Using CSE submit has been posted. Uh, instructions for using CSE submit have been posted both on Piazza and as part of the homework assignment. Uh, so if there are any problems, uh, let us know. All right, um, so let's actually get to the meat of the lecture. We've been talking for the past week and a half about how to interact with a database. We've been setting up a language, uh, a way to discuss uh, the, the techniques and um, the, to discuss uh, what a database does and, and how it uh, expresses both questions about data uh, as well as transformations on the data. Uh, today, I'd like to go much uh, to a much lower level and talk about uh, how we can actually implement those things uh, efficiently. And really, the starting point for this uh, is one of the most central questions, central challenges uh, in data management, which is that moving data around is hard. Um, it's expensive, time-consuming, uh, memory inefficient, power inefficient, however you want to classify it, it's hard. And so really the, the central question that data management systems are trying to address is how do we get data where it needs to be? So this question manifests in a number of different ways. And uh, correspondingly, we have a number of different ways of answering it. Uh, but really the the central place where this question manifests is in the memory hierarchy. So a quick show of hands, who's been exposed to this, uh, the memory hierarchy in uh, operating systems architecture? OK, wow. Um, all right, I guess it's good that I put it on here. Uh, so a typical computer is going to have multiple layers of, um, of storage capacity. Uh, this goes from the registers all the way down to uh, the cache lines, uh, to the RAM, and then to the actual uh, hard disks and, and persistent storage uh, in the device. And even the network uh, underneath everything uh, can be viewed, viewed as, as part of this hierarchy. And the observation is that uh, towards the, the top of this hierarchy, you have um, very, very rapid 
uh, very easily easy to access data storage. So a, a CPU's registers can be accessed within one uh, CPU cycle. Uh, conversely, the at the bottom of this, uh, a hard disk typically takes hundreds, thousands, or, or even more uh, cycles uh, to uh, fetch data uh, from the disk into uh, and and put it in a place where the the CPU can actually access it. So. The, the, the big challenge of the memory hierarchy is making sure that the data that you're, that you're currently using is situated as close to the CPU as possible. Uh, because pushing uh, data up the hierarchy is, uh, gets progressively more expensive. And one of the questions that we're going to try and answer over the course of the term uh, is how do we make sure that data uh, lives as close to the CPU as possible um, as long as possible and uh, as early as possible. Any questions on the memory hierarchy? All right. Um, good. So, uh, right. So, getting back to this question of how do we get data where it needs to be? Um, now, in the case of the memory hierarchy, this question is obvi obvious. Where, where the data needs to be is in the registers. It needs to be as close to the CPU as possible. And well, there's a fairly limited, uh, there, there's a number of different ways that we can uh, achieve that. But uh, really, where, where the data needs to be is very clearly defined. Um, there's a range of other. Uh, other cases, however, where uh, this, this where the data needs to be is actually a much more open question. Um, we're actually allowed to reorganize the data and uh, put it in a form that uh, makes sense. And so this question can be generalized a little bit uh, to how do we get data uh, into a form where we can find what we're looking for. Now, if we have just a big blob of bits, well, that's not particularly useful to us. Um, there's not much we can do uh, to optimize that. There's not much we can do to optimize access to that. Um, if I would like to get uh, a particular record, I actually need to have some sort of uh, external information or some uh, way to determine that record one uh, is represented by bits one to 20 of this big binary blob. Now, if I know that record one is represented by bits one to 20, well, that's great. I can just get those bits and only the bits that I'm looking for. Uh, but being able to uh, organize the data in such a way that that's uh, possible uh, is basically the second half of this problem. Now, there's a whole spectrum of different organizational strategies that we can use. Uh, one of these is uh, three different points in, in that spectrum uh, occur fairly frequently. Uh, one is that we can simply store the data without any organization. So uh, this is called a heap, uh, where the data is just stored uh, completely randomly. Um, or, well, not entirely randomly. There's a little bit of structure, uh, but the, the data isn't stored in any particular order. There's no uh, exceptional effort that goes into organizing it. Um, alternatively, we could actually store the data in, in sort of the same uh, basic structure as, as an array or a sequence of, of, uh, of records. But we can group them together. We can organize them into a particular, uh, into a, we can sort them in a particular order. Uh, and as a third strategy, we can actually take uh, an external data structure and use that to organize the data for us. So keeping the data in the same uh, sort of a, we keep it laid out however it, it happens to be laid out, but then we use an external structure uh, to point to the particular records or to, to identify where the records that we're interested in uh, are stored. So these are three general uh, points on the spectrum of, of possible storage approaches. Um, what are some benefits and drawbacks to each? So uh, for example, uh, a, ha a heap. Uh, what, what are why would we want to store data in, in a heap? Uh, 
Uh, say that again? Yeah, so it's uh, the uh, heap is an incredibly uh, efficient, uh, efficient for writing. There is no organization, so we don't need to do any sort of, uh, there, there's very little organizational overhead that we need uh, to be able to store data in a heap. Uh, what, uh, what would be a drawback? Yeah, um, so the data is, um, it's, there's no effort that goes into organizing it, but the, the, the converse is that, uh, well, if it's not organized, we have to, uh, it's much harder for us to find what we're looking for. Um, what about an index? So what's uh, an advantage to using an index? Fast access, okay. Anything else? Speak up. Okay, so you can you can very quickly identify uh, a record that you're looking for, um, and you can do it without actually affecting the storage structure that you're uh, that you're working with. You can basically build this on top of any sort of data layout, as long as you can identify, uh, you have some quick and easy way to identify where the records are located. Uh, what about drawbacks? So what's a uh, disadvantage? Yes? Okay, so there's, the, um, there's a complexity cost and there's a storage cost. So uh, if we want to keep an index, we have the additional overhead of actually storing that index, saving that index, uh, and uh, also the additional com uh, compute cost of maintaining that index. Um, so related question would be uh, what happens, uh, does it matter what kind of uh, storage medium we're using? Does it matter where in this, uh, in the memory hierarchy, uh, this is, uh, these various data structures are being used? Yes, uh, so could you give a, an example of one way that it would be affected? So if you are, I'm not sure I follow, uh, if you're closer to the processor, it makes more sense to index the data? Okay, so if you... I see. So if you're, um, if you are doing more reads than transformations of the data, uh, it makes more sense to uh, index it. So how would you compare index, uh, an index and a, um, a sorted data layout in terms of performance? Okay, so the index will be slower than the sorted uh, and a sorted uh, table. Why? Uh, why is that? Okay. So with an index, there's an additional step. Uh, I'm going to disagree with you on one thing. It's not always strictly more or less expensive uh, to do an index versus a store. But I do. Uh, but what you said there, that it's a two-step process, is, is something that is quite important. Um, and something that we'll get back to in a two or th three or four lectures when we talk about indexing. Um, OK. So one. There's one additional um, point I'm going to make about indexes, and that that is that the the way that the storage medium 
that the underlying data is being stored on, the, the, the data that's being indexed, uh, is actually quite relevant to how an index performs. Um, as we'll see in a short while, uh, if so how, uh, how would, if I'm looking for a particular record um, or a particular range of records that an index can quickly identify, um, what kind of access pattern would I get if I was using an index versus if I was using a, uh, a sorted array? Give someone else a chance. Yes? Yep. So with an index, you're not, you have this additional data structure that tells you which records are relevant, uh, but there's no guarantee that those records are going to be stored um, in sequence. And as we'll, sh as we'll uh, shortly see, there's actually quite a bit of benefit uh, to having all of your records, um, to, have, to reading batches of records that are stored uh, sequentially, uh, particularly when we're working with hard disks. So okay, uh, those are kind of the two general questions. We can subdivide those even further. Um, the, the, this question of how do, we, uh, how do we put data where we need it, uh, where it needs to be, and how do we get it there, uh, boils down to four, what I think of as four questions. Um, so the first is how do we take advantage of the memory hierarchy? How do we uh, make sure that the data is uh, as close to the, the top of the memory hierarchy as possible. And one important factor, one uh, way of, or one fairly common way of addressing that problem is to uh, control how you access the data. Uh, when you design a, a data management algorithm, as we'll see over the course of the term, uh, there's a very broad uh, range of ways that you can implement a particular query. Um, each of those ways that you can implement a particular query is going to access the data in a slightly different pattern. And that data access pattern um, is, is very important. And so uh, the next question is how do we pick the right data access pattern uh, for the storage medium, medium that we're using? Um, now, in addition to the memory hierarchy, you also want to be able to organize, uh, figure out how the data is organized. And you want to come up with a way that is uh, that, as, as we said earlier, uh, the, there's a cost that is, is associated with uh, maintaining this organizational structure, and there's a cost benefit that you get uh, down the line when you actually try and read data out of this organizational structure. And so uh, there's a bit of a trade-off between um, getting the not doing work early on and not doing work later when you try and read the data out. Uh, these questions have been implemented in a uh, variety of data management systems and typically uh, they're in a component that is in, they're split between two components or the answers to these questions uh, are two components in, in, a, um, in a typical data management management system uh, called the buffer manager and the file manager. And uh, today we're going to be talking uh, first about the buffer manager and then a little bit more about uh, the file manager. But before I get into that, um, I want to take an even uh, bigger step back and talk a little bit, a little bit about the actual hardware, um, the characteristics of the hardware that we're working with, because that's going to go uh, the, the characteristics of the hardware are a very important uh, factor in the design of, or the, the understanding of these, these access patterns. So I'm going to generalize and simplify the, the entire memory hierarchy into uh, three layers, um, just for the, the sake of simplicity. Uh, you have data on disk. Data on disk can be read or uh, written to disk or read in from uh, RAM. And then you can perform computations on the data that's located in RAM. And the observation is that the, uh, the, uh, the cost of writing and reading data from disk 
to and from disk is high. Now, this is a little bit of a simplification. Uh, there's obviously multiple layers to this, this memory hier hierarchy, but as, we'll, uh, as you'll see if you try and uh, map this, you can very easily map anything that we, we talk about in the context of this simple uh, three-layer hierarchy uh, into, a much, uh, into pretty much any three layers of, of the memory hierarchy or even more. Um, to give you an example, let's say we have a, a single computer, sing, that single computer is accessing a single disk. Um, if we want to scale that out, we have to start using uh, a network. And uh, once again, uh, once we're using a network, um, the cost of transmitting data uh, between these, these machines, of getting the data uh, to where it needs to be in the, in the processing pipeline, uh, becomes really the, the core bottleneck. And so what I'm getting at here is that this simple three-layer hierarchy uh, really sort of captures the, the core problem that we're trying to address with the memory hierarchy. Any questions so far? All right. Now, the astute observer will uh, note that there is a very simple solution to this problem, and that's to avoid it altogether. Um, so what happens if we simply cut out the disk entirely? Well, we do run into a couple of problems. Um, so first off, RAM, is, as you go further up in the memory hierarchy, uh, the sizes of the, the data that you're working with have to get smaller and smaller. Uh, correspondingly, the price uh, for getting more storage goes up. And more importantly, uh, RAM is uh, what's called volatile. So as soon as you turn off the computer, or uh, more generally, as soon, or, uh, as soon as something turns off the computer, whether it's a, a human uh, or a backhoe cutting through a power line, um, the, the contents of RAM will go away. Um, but that said, is it still reasonable to consider a, a database that is built entirely in memory? Um, yes, it is. Um, so a, there's a whole class of database engines, uh, one of which you'll be writing for Checkpoint 1, uh, called in-memory databases. Now these tend to be much faster for uh, query processing uh, because memory is obviously faster. Um, but of course they run into a number of, of uh, challenges. So these databases can't provide persistence, and they typically tend to scale a little bit uh, more poorly. Um, I'm going to push that last question uh, down a little bit, because there are ways of making, this, uh, making these scale. Uh, but we're going to talk about those a little bit later in the term. Uh, what about persistence? So how, what are some techniques you might think that we, we could use to uh, ensure that the, the data stays persistent? Locks? What do you mean by locks? Oh, logs. Yeah, so you can, um, as the data is being computed in memory, you also record uh, the changes that have, uh, the updates that have been applied uh, to disk. Any other suggestions? Yes. Um, could you expand on that a little? Okay, so one, uh, so another strategy is to actually use this for um, either static data or data that is um, temporarily volatile. You. Uh, read the data in disk, you perform some heavy computation on it, some heavy transformations on it, and then you record it back to disk after you're done. Um, okay, those are some good ways uh, for, for persistence. Um, we'll actually talk about a few others 
uh, further in on the lecture. Okay, um, so one last thing, uh, and that is the actual hardware. So, uh, quick show of hands, who's taken an architecture course, a computer architecture course? Okay. Um, who has a general sense of what happens inside a hard disk? Okay, slightly different hands, slightly more. Good. Um, so there's, I'd like to at least give you a vague sense of what's happening inside one of these devices because that drives, that very heavily drives um, how most database systems uh, work. Um, the, the sort of characteristics, the performance characteristics of these disks, and both uh, hard disks and, and flash disks. So from an external perspective, uh, the disk exposes a very simple interface. Um, it is a big array of what are called pages. Um, every page is, uh, well, it depends on the, the disk, it depends on um, a number of things, but typically somewhere around 4 to 16 kilobytes uh, worth of data per page. And uh, basically the API it exposes is um, give me page X or this range of pages and then you get back uh, at some point in the future uh, the contents of those pages. Now one thing that particularly factors into database design is the fact that uh, tuples or data records are typically going to be a lot smaller uh, than the four kilobytes of a page and reading in a page is typically going to be reasonably expensive. So often uh, what you want to do is make sure that multiple uh, records are stored in a single page. Now this leads to some potential problems. Uh, any uh, thoughts on what, some, what that prob uh, those problems might be? I'm hearing some voices. Uh, could you speak up? Speak up or raise your hand. So if I store, yes? You might need to kind of reserve the page and I can add just two bytes of data. Okay, so if, uh, if the tuple is uh, approaching the size of uh, four kilobytes, we might need to waste a lot of space uh, sort of at the very, uh, if we want to keep the tuple entirely within one page. Um, what if we have uh, two or more uh, tuples in a given page? So this was alluded to uh, a little bit earlier. What happens if we want to read in, um, let's say, uh, tuples 152 and 123. How many pages, uh, if we can store 10 tuples per page, how many tup, uh, pages would we need to read in? So if the tuples are mapped, uh, 1 to 10 is on page 1, uh, 11 to 20 on page 2, and so forth. Uh, and we want to read uh, 11, 153, and uh, 99. How many pages is that going to be? Six? Okay. Uh, so, if I, yeah, in the, uh, in the example that I'm giving, you have to read one, uh, each page is on a single tuple. Uh, sorry, each tuple uh, is on its own page. So I have to read in all of those pages. And kind of the problem uh, th this, this leads to a bit of a, uh, to one of these situations where it really makes sense to have uh, your records, uh, to, to, to do record reads uh, in sequential order. Um, if I read one tuple, I'd like to be able to uh, use the, the remaining tuples on the page that I've just read in, because otherwise I've spent a huge amount of effort loading uh, an entire page in for very little benefit. Okay, um, that's not the only reason that we might want to uh, have sequential access. Uh, and in order to understand 
why, uh, let's take a little bit closer look at how hard disks are constructed. So a typical hard disk is going to have a couple of different uh, platters. Um, it, well, this is a grad class, so there might be some of you uh, who know what a record or CD is. Um, unlikely, but uh, the so there's a bunch of these platters, these spinning things, which have uh, essentially a bunch of concentric circles on them. And each of these concentric circles uh, is where, for lack of a better term, data gets deposited. Uh, there are a couple of these uh, heads that kind of swing back and forth across the platter and actually do the reads and writes. Uh, now, in order to actually perform a read, three things have to happen. So first, uh, the head has to move to the right position. And that uh, takes usually on the order of 1 to 20 milliseconds. Sometimes a little bit faster, but uh, it varies. And this, this is typically referred to as the seek time. Now, after the head gets into the right place, the data that you're looking for may not be in that particular location on the spinning platter. So the, the platter actually has to spin until the data is located under the head where it can be read out. That's typically referred to as the rotational delay and usually depends on the speed of the drive, the, the, um, the RPM of the drive. Um, usually, again, between 1 to 10 milliseconds. Finally, once the data that you're looking for is under the head, the disk actually has to spin into the right uh, spin so that the head can read off uh, the data that you're looking for. And this tends to be about one millisecond uh, per page. So with this information in mind, how might we improve the efficiency of uh, a read uh, on a hard disk? Yes? Bingo. So if you keep, so it makes sense in this particular setup to keep all of your data actually physically located um, in an adjacent position. And if the data is located, uh, in fact, on the same track, on the same platter, then uh, very little has to happen uh, for the data uh, to get into position to be read out. And you know, if the data is just stored sequentially, then the data can be just read out immediately. Um, now, if you can't store it in the same uh, on the same platter, you can store it in the same position on a different platter. Uh, so the, the tracks uh, extending down across the platters, uh, we call that a cylinder. Um, so in that case, all that has to happen is a little switch has to, uh, the, the, the hard disk has to just switch to a different platter. Uh, the other possibility, well, if, if you run out, out of space on the same cylinder, move it to a different, um, to a different cylinder, but again, if the, uh, if the cylinder is located physically close, then that means that the disk head doesn't have to move that far, and in turn you get better performance. Okay. Any questions on hard disks? All right, cool. Um, so more recently we've been seeing Lots and lots of uh, computers with flash memory. Case in, yeah. Case in point. Uh, the flash memory has a number of advantages over rotational platter disks. Um, among others, the fact that because there's no moving parts, uh, there's actually very little uh, cost to moving to a different uh, position. Uh, in fact, there's no cost to moving to a different position. You don't have seek time or rotational delay. Um, now, there are a couple of sort of disadvantages to flash. Um, and there's a couple of disadvantages to flash. Does anyone know what these are off the top of their heads? So one fairly major problem with flash is that it tends to fail after a certain number of writes. Um, 
more precisely, every time you erase uh, information on a flash disk, the the blocks, the pages that store those um, that store the records that just got erased end up degrading. And usually you can get about 100,000 to maybe a million uh, write cycles before you actually um, completely mess up that, that excuse me, that, uh, that particular uh, block on the flash. Uh, this basically means that Flash is really nice for read-heavy workloads. It's not, uh, it is still reasonable for write-heavy workloads, but uh, tends to, can require uh, considerable uh, cost if you have to replace them um, over and over. One other uh, thing to note is that the way Flash works, erasure hap has to happen um, on a whole region of the flash uh, memory. You have to erase uh, a large chunk of it at a time. Uh, but you can write uh, to it fairly quickly. So flash tends to be much better uh, for these sort of append heavy workloads, where you uh, erase a whole batch of it and then just sequentially write uh, data uh, to it. Um, also, unlike a regular hard disk, it supports random reads much more efficiently. As I said, there are no moving parts, so you can read whichever page you like. Uh, was there a question? OK, so uh, in general, Flash tends to be faster, both in terms of read and write. Uh, and it supports random reads much more efficiently. Uh, Flash still works on, uh, page, on uh, page granularity. so there's still some benefit to sequential reads and, and writes, but not quite as much as on a hard disk. Um, that said, hard disks tend to be considerably more durable, uh, and even now they t they're still noticeably bigger than, uh, than flash memory. Um, and as I said, the, there's sort of this batch erasure cost uh, with flash, which tends to which can make writes uh, considerably slower if you need to, to do it frequently. Um, so which of these would be better? Yeah. Were you raising your hand or? Yeah, so, um, so yes, uh, that, that was basically a bit of a, a trick question. The answer is neither is better. As, as you point out, if there's, uh, it depends on the kind of uh, database that you're building on, or uh, data management system that you're building on top of it. Um, if you have smaller data, uh, smaller data that is uh, less write heavy, uh, flash might be better. If you uh, tend to append very regularly to your data, uh, ends up essentially being very write heavy, uh, very read light, um, hard disks can be much more efficient. And it really depends on, on what kind of workload you're, using, you're, you're throwing at it. So OK. Um, OK. So we've talked a little bit about the uh, the actual hardware uh, that goes into the uh, databases might be built on. Now let's talk a little bit about how to actually let me let me uh, bring this up from a slightly different angle. Um, there are a number of inefficiencies to these disks. Yes. 
Yeah, uh, so that's a perfectly uh, legitimate use of, uh, of Flash as a, as a layer in the memory hierarchy. And if uh, memory serves... Yeah, uh, so you can potentially position uh, Flash as just another layer in the memory hierarchy. Um, faster than files, but slower than physical memory. Does that address your question? Any other questions? All right, so we've talked about um, the hardware, and there's a couple of drawbacks to, to some of this hardware. Um, hard disks can, uh, can be a bit slow. Uh, Maybe you've encountered hard disks actually failing. They're, physically, they're physical devices, and they wear out. Um, same thing with Flash. Flash can wear out even faster. Um, and of course, all of these uh, can be uh, kind of uh, slow. And so one thing I'd like to uh, touch on, because it's kind of also fairly connected to databases, uh, is how do we take these, these um, slow, potentially fa failure-prone uh, devices and make them uh, more resilient. Now, my, my kind of hidden subtext here is that, not so hidden subtext, I should say, uh, is that these techniques for making uh, hard disks more uh, resilient and more uh, efficient are actually also applicable to the other levels of the memory hierarchy. Um, so after we talk about this, we'll kind of talk a little bit about how uh, these ideas can be extended uh, to uh, things like net, uh, network devices and, um, and the like. So any ideas how, do, how we might uh, take a hard disk and make it more efficient? Or how we might take two hard disks and make them more efficient? Yes? Clustering, Clustering yes. So we can take two hard disks and we can um, essentially treat them as if they were one hard disk. And by doing that, we can introduce uh, various forms of re resiliency. Um, in particular, we can uh, replicate the data or, or store the same data multiple times, uh, or we can, uh, yeah, uh, or we can uh, partition the data and store it in multiple different places uh, each of which will now have a, a slightly lighter workload uh, to work with. Um, and this boils down to a uh, technology that has been around longer than I have um, called RAID, um, which, depending on how you, uh, who you talk to, uh, stands for a redundant array of independent disks, redundant array of inexpensive disks, um, and there's a couple of... Uh, other variants of that that I can't mention in polite company. Um, so there's, the idea, however, is that you take a bunch of disks and you take, uh, you merge them and create a sort of uh, virtual uh, single disk out of all of them. And all of the, all of the different types of RAID uh, that we're, in, we're going to talk about essentially use one of two basic strategies, uh, one called striping and one called mirroring. Uh, striping is going to take uh, a data file and spread it out across multiple disks. So whenever I want to read this data file, I need to read uh, from two different uh, or three different disks. Uh, mirroring, on the other hand, takes a, a piece of data and it replicates that piece of data across multiple disks. Uh, so one disk is still sufficient to answer any of my questions. Uh, so if the other disk happens to fail, uh, get knocked offline, uh, or somehow I lose access to it, uh, the, the first disk is still uh, accessible to me. Now, RAID was invented back before they had catchy names for, the, for things. So every uh, RAID is... It, the various ways to approach, uh, to, to apply RAID to a particular problem um, are expressed in terms of levels. Um, from, there's 
enumerate about six, and I think there's a couple more. Uh, the first level, uh, level zero, uses purely striping. So I have a file here consisting of, uh, what is that, eight, uh, 12 blocks, and I can store those blocks uh, across two different disks by basically splitting them. Um, let's say first block goes on disk one, second block on disk two, and alternating that uh, that way. Uh, RAID level one, well, like uh, level zero does striping only, level one does mirroring only. Um, one drawback to this is that you can only use uh, two disks. Um, and you basically take the entire file and you replicate it uh, across both disks. Um, now, whenever you want to read, uh, you actually get much better bandwidth with, uh, sorry, you get comparable bandwidth with both uh, RAID levels one and two, uh, because I, uh, if I want to read the entire file, I can use the bandwidth of both disks to read out the data that I'm looking for. On the other hand, when I'm writing, I have to write to both disks. So I end up having not much uh, of an improvement in, in terms of bandwidth for, uh, for level one. Uh, there is a RAID level that actually combines these two, zero plus one, uh, which both stripes the data uh, and then within each stripe uh, mirrors uh, the uh, creates two copies of, of that stripe. Um, so if I'm striping across n disks, I get an n-wise improvement in my, my bandwidth, and I get an n over, well, I get half that uh, in terms of improvement for writing, because as before, I have to write two copies of the data. Any questions up to this point? All right, um, so after zero and one, there's a handful of different uh, ways that uh, approaches that use uh, levels two through four basically use uh, striping, but in addition to the stripe, add what's called a parity bit. And the idea is that with um, with a handful of different parity bits, I can reconstruct the data that is, is being stored on the disk from, some, from any subset of these disks that includes at least, um, well, so in this case, uh, this is what's called a, a 7-4 uh, parity. Uh, I have, for every four bits of data, I have three additional parity bits. And the idea is that I can lose any three of these disks and still be able to reconstruct the original file. Um, and the main distinction between levels two through four is the granularity at which this parity occurs. Um, for level two, it occurs at the bit level. Uh, for level three, it occurs at the byte level. And for level four, it occurs uh, at the block or page level. Any questions? All right. Now this kind of connects to something that uh, I encourage you to, to look at off, offline because it's kind of cool, uh, called Hamming, Tornado, or Reed solomon codes. Um, they're different forms of the same thing. Uh, the idea is basically that you have uh, k additional uh, pieces of data, and uh, you can lose that many pieces of data and still be able to reconstruct uh, the, the original data set. And this is very, very frequently used uh, in video encoding and um, in sort of low-level uh, data transmission uh, systems. Uh, it, it's kind of cool. I encourage you to look at it, uh, but it's not really much, uh, not really much else here. Okay, so no, we are. All right. Um, let's move that to 
So there is a subject for discussion on Piazza that I, for discussion that I'd like to move to Piazza, which is um, this uh, raid, these raid layers are not just applicable to the, uh, to the hard disk layer. Um, the same basic principles apply to any uh, level of the memory hierarchy that can potentially fail. Um, the network is one very good example of this. And the same basic principles of mirroring and striping appear very frequently in uh, distributed systems work as well. Only there they're called uh, replication and partitioning. Um, so I'd like to move that particular uh, discussion uh, to Piazza. Um, as before, uh, if there are particularly insightful comments, I'll be awarding uh, various uh, baked goods. All right, so, so we've talked about the hardware. Um, we've talked about how, uh, how certain levels of the memory hierarchy have unusual access patterns that we might want to exploit when designing uh, various algorithms. But the memory hierarchy itself has a, uh, has a fairly obvious uh, challenge in, in its access patterns, and that's that you want, you, you have a certain amount of data that you can work with, and you want to make sure that that data gets used to the fullest extent possible. So as an example, let's take a look at an implementation of a simple select predicate. So here I have a bit of pseudocode uh, for, that would implement a selection operator. So it's a simple loop. Uh, as long as I have more tuples to read in, I'm going to read those tuples in. I'm going to apply my selection predicate to them, and then I'm going to output that tuple. Does anyone see? Oh, uh, and then, then I'm going to output that tuple. Now, there are two kind of immediate places where I can look at this algorithm and say, yeah, that's going to be a problem. Um, the first is when I read something if I'm reading from disk, that's going to create an extremely high latency. Um, and the second problem is that when I output something, that output has to go somewhere. And if it happens to be memory, great. But what happens, excuse me, what happens if I run out of memory, or what happens if, uh, if I have to go to disk? And that also leads to a, a fairly high latency. So, what we kind of want to happen under the covers here is we want to have some mechanism that doesn't force us to go to disk for every single tuple, something, something that actually buffers these tuples. So as we're reading things in, we want to be able to prefetch. We know that we're, all, we're going to be accessing this entire stream of tuples. We want to be able to prefetch all of those tuples, load them into memory, have them accessible, so that when we actually do want to process them, uh, they're already there. And we're not blocking on, on those tuples. And when we're outputting things, we also want to have some uh, contiguous region of memory that stores uh, the, 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 temp the tuples temporarily. Now, because this is a, a particular problem that occurs frequently, uh, it makes sense to generalize and standardize it, to, to take this, uh, this problem and abstract it into an, a component of the overall uh, data management system. And what this typically manifests as uh, is a component called a buffer manager. And well, there are various different names for it, but practically every data management system has one of these uh, buffer managers or, or something very much like it. Uh, the typical API for one of these buffer managers uh, is that you can uh, both create and destroy pages, malloc and release, if you're familiar. Um, you can 
read a, pa a particular page in from disk, or you can write a particular, uh, sorry, uh, you can read from a page or write to a page. Um, so typically the buffer manager is going to allocate a whole chunk of memory and will read pages in from disk and flush them back to disk as soon as it's possible to do so. Um, it also allows higher levels of the database uh, to do what's called pinning a page. To take a particular page and say, I am actively using this region of memory. Please make sure that that doesn't um, leave memory. I'm actively using this, uh, and, and therefore you shouldn't uh, release it for more general use. And the buffer manager also allows you to uh, prefetch data. So it essentially connects the, uh, the data that's stored on disk to the uh, data. It, it, it essentially handles the data, data movement between disk and memory. Um, okay. So as I said, the, because of the fact that the buffer manager uh, Because of the fact that the buffer manager has the ability to sort of move things out of memory, to, to release memory, um, it's important for the higher level components uh, to be able to indicate that they don't want a particular piece of memory uh, to be released. So what will happen is that uh, the, the higher levels uh, can notify the buffer manager by pinning it. And then after modifying these pages, uh, also will typically notify the buffer manager uh, whether or not a particular page has been changed. Now this is relevant because if a particular page has been changed, uh, it has to be written back to disk before it can be released uh, into the general memory pool. Um, whereas if it hasn't been changed, then you can pretty much just discard it in place. Um, the buffer manager will take a, a somewhat proactive approach uh, to freeing up memory. So if its, uh, if its buffer is getting full, it'll start uh, erasing pages or, or freeing them, uh, writing them to disk and freeing them up for general use. And depending on the system you're talking about, uh, it can use one of a variety of different policies uh, for this process. Um, and which policy gets used really depends on the, the kind of data access pattern that you're using. Now, a uh, quick show of hands, how many people here have taken operating systems? OK, so most of you by this point should be kind of scratching your heads and saying, this, this kind of sounds really, really familiar to something that I'm sure you're, you're quite familiar with. Um, this, what I'm describing is really a form of virtual memory. And if, if you would, were to say that, uh, I would say yes. This is basically a form of, of virtual memory. And in fact, a lot of more lightweight data management systems, uh, in fact, use virtual memory as their buffer manager. Now, there's a couple of reasons not to do that. There's a couple of reasons that most uh, commercial grade uh, database or data management systems actually have their own. And that's really boils down to the level of control that virtual memory gives you. Um, so virtual memory really has very little um, ability to indicate how, you're, how you will be accessing data. Um, you do have some limited facility for pinning. You do have some limited facility for prefetching. But um, you do have some limited facility for prefetching. But by building your own, you have much more control over what gets uh, paged in, when it gets paged in, when it gets paged out, um, and the replacement policy that's uh, available. And it also allows you to integrate additional layers. Um, so it's, uh, a system like HDFS, for example, uh, is you could think of it as an integrated 
buffer manager um, that actually uses the network. Uh, it's a distributed file system that has this sort of uh, caching process that is, is uh, used by a buffer manager. So we are running a bit low on time. Uh, all right, we are running a little bit low on time, so I'm going to skip to the last thing I had. So getting to, going back to the beginning of the talk, I mentioned heap files. So a heap has no logical structure to it, but it still has some uh, limited amount of, of uh, layout, just so that you can actually find the data records that you're looking for. Um, this kind of boils down to a question of, I have a record. I, I know what a tuple looks like. It's uh, an officer with a first name, a last name, and a rank uh, is two strings and a float. But something that a lot of people uh, kind of don't intuitively get is the, the fact that when you're storing that on a page in disk, there's a, a lot of work that actually goes into organizing that information in such a way that you can retrieve it efficiently. Even if it's not stored in any particular uh, order, you still need to be able to, to access the individual fields of that tuple. And so there's a variety of different strategies that we can take uh, when trying to serialize uh, records into, uh, into a, a disk or, or um, a more persistent form of storage. So let's start with the records themselves. And there's a couple of different ways that, this, uh, that a record can be stored. The first of which is that the record itself has a fixed length. Now, if we know the schema, we can actually design a, a, a fixed length record, uh, record size. Um, if we know that the record starts at byte 423, and we know that the first uh, the first field is an integer, then we know that rec the second field starts at byte 427, assuming it's a four-byte integer. Um, so this is one strategy. A second strategy would be to take these, um, to store the records in a variable length uh, field, but rather than uh, delimiting them by sort of previously known addresses, previously known points, uh, we can delimit, delimit them by some specific identifiers. So what might be a, a, why might I use one of these approaches over the other? So what's an advantage of the, the um, this, uh, of the fixed length record size? So when you're, uh, you don't have to worry about uh, parsing the data out. Uh, you don't have to scan through the entire record uh, to get an individual field of the record. And this is kind of important if you have really big records. Um, what about this uh, format? What, uh, what might be an advantage of using delimiters? So you can have uh, data that is a variable size. Um, what's a disadvantage of, of this, by the way? Hmm? So you have to scan the entire thing. Um, any other potential drawbacks to using a delimiter character? OK, so there's lots of wasted space. And there's actually a much more subtle, yes, in the back? Right, so what happens if the delimiter is, is part of the data? So how much you address that? Okay, so you can have an escape character. Um, 
now one of the advantages uh, that was mentioned is that you can have variable size uh, records. There, um, can anyone uh, come up with one strategy for uh, having variable size records but without using delimiters? Pointers. Yep. So one potential strategy is to actually have um, in a known location in the record uh, a set of pointers that identify where in the record uh, a particular field starts. So you still need to access that initial, um, that initial uh, array of, of uh, field offsets, but you can, you can use that to um, very quickly, very uh, efficiently jump to where the record starts. Okay, so we've talked about records. These are fairly, uh, records themselves are, um, are nice. Uh, what about pages? So recall, uh, again, going back to the beginning of the lecture, we talked about how, um, we talked about uh, the fact that you might want to store multiple records in a single page. Now, there's a handful of different ways that you can accomplish this. Uh, one of which is to uh, is to actually take oh. laying the records out within a specific page. Um, you might want to keep all of the records together. You might want to uh, allocate them in uh, a more freeform way. Um, if you do the first, in either of these cases, you want to have some way of identifying which records are valid and which records are just sort of blank space. Uh, so in the first case, you only need to identify where that boundary is. Uh, in the second case, you actually have to identify for every single record whether that record is present or not. And you can do that with a, a densely packed uh, bit array. Um, what might be some advantages to, to each of these approaches? So what about the densely packed uh, array? Yes. Yep, so it's much, much uh, quicker for me to scan over all of the records of this because they're contiguous. And moving up even further in the memory hierarchy, because they're densely packed together, I can make more efficient use of my cache lines. Um, what about the unpacked form? Uh, what's uh, an advantage of using that? Mm -hmm. Can you speak up a little? So it gives you space for, um, for growing a record. That's a great reason. Um, and a related reason is deletions. So if I delete a record, um, in the packed case, I'd actually have to do uh, multiple manipulations to get the, rec uh, get the page back into packed form. Um, yeah, and each of them has uh, slightly different um, advantages. Uh, there's a, now each of those tends to work best when I have a fixed record size. Uh, because otherwise I have to manipulate data. Uh, what I can do as uh, if I want to store variable size records, I can do something kind of like what I did, uh, what we did with the, um, the variable size record fields, where I have a uh, array at the very end of the record in a known location that tells me where uh, every record starts. And now I can have, uh, records of variable size, I can give them some room to grow potentially, um, and I can uh, still very quickly access the individual records. Okay. So that's how we store data at the page granularity. But now uh, we might have multiple pages in a given file. So that is to say we might have uh, more records than we can fit in a single page. So we need to have some uh, way of 
organizing the pages, of, of identifying the pages, of linking them together in such a way that we can easily access uh, the pages that we're interested in uh, finding data in. So um, if we're, what I'm going to focus on for this is uh, specifically heap files. Um, you can kind of use the same basic techniques for, um, for sorted data files. Now, how might I organize, uh, what are some ways that I might take various pages and, and link them together uh, to, so that I can very efficiently access, uh, access the records in that file? So if I had three pages, and I wanted to be able to express each of those, page, uh, those pages as a file, how would, I, how would I persist that information to disk? system, I have three pages, and these contain all of my data. Um, these contain all of my data. How would I, uh, how would I express, so naively, with, without any additional information, um, these are just three pages sitting around on my, my disk, and I've really no way to identify them. Um, how would I express the fact that these three pages constitute a file? Back. OK, so I can have another page somewhere in here that points all of these three pages and expresses, uh, OK, these three pages constitute one file. And now I have a pointer to this uh, this page that expresses um, that expresses that that is the the page that I'm looking for. Now, what if, what if we wanted to do only linear scans on this? Uh, the only kind of data access we were doing was scanning through all of the records in their entirety. Is there? A Uh, can you speak up? Uh, where? In the page. In each of these pages? Yeah. Uh, what, so what information would I store? Uh, the file ID. So if three pages are after the same file. A pointer back to the original file? Something like that? So just the ID, any ID. OK. And I have that same piece of information in each of these. Um, OK. So how does that help me compared to uh, the pointers to the file? Or what is, uh, what is the advantage of having uh, Okay, so you um, you could potentially store each of these uh, files sequentially, and then just have a marker in there to tell you when you've reached the end of the file. Okay, great, um, great. The oh, we've uh, come up with a couple of very nice strategies that I haven't. Um, I haven't slides for, um, so that's, that's great. Um, you guys are, are going way past me here. Um, so this is one, one particular, uh, strategy to have a pointer like that. 
Um, one other strategy that's actually a little bit cruder um, that we um, that we didn't mention so far is to actually just have a linked list of pages. Um, and this works nicely if you can't allocate sequential pages. You have a sequence of uh, pages pointing, each pointing to uh, the next page uh, that is in the file. Uh, one slight advantage of this is that it allows you to, uh, you don't have to keep uh, this index page in memory. The only thing you have to, you, you never have to keep more than one uh, particular page uh, in memory. So okay, um, if you're interested in this, um, I encourage you to look up a feature of whatever your favorite flavor of database management system is called the system catalog. And in fact, uh, MySQL, Postgres, Oracle, uh, SQL Server, each of them actually does, does something really kind of cute, which is um, to store the, uh, to store all of the metadata, all of the information about how the file is, uh, how it's, it's storing information on disk uh, within a set of relations. Uh, basically, you, you can get metadata about how the system is operating as a relation in and of itself. Um, so all of the relations are going to be metadata about the relations is stored in what's called the system catalog. Um, information about uh, indexes, view definitions, all sorts of other things that we'll be talking about later in the term. Um, all of this information is actually stored in the system catalog. There's some really interesting uh, things that pop up uh, that uh, decisions on how, uh, the uh, how the relation is stored on disk, decisions on uh, what kind of uh, file allocate, uh, how the, the files are, are uh, represented. Um, and as, as a bit of an exercise, find your favorite flavor of, um, of uh, database and actually explore how this, uh, how it stores um, all, of, all, of its, um, all of its data. So okay, um, let me wrap up really quickly. Uh, we talked about, about a variety of different things today. We talked about how uh, the memory hierarchy works and how uh, specifically the buffer manager uh, helps us tr um, manage data through the various levels of the memory hier hierarchy. Um, we talked about uh, how hard disks work. We talked about how that has an impact on both the buffer manager and how we page things into memory, how we access data. Uh, what kind of data access patterns we use, and we talked about um, how you can actually lay information out um, on a disk in memory, um, and how you might serialize uh, records on a disk. So, one last thing, are there any questions? All right, so I'll see everyone next week, and on Monday we're going to be talking about query evaluation, um, which is basically, long story short, I'll be telling you more or less how to implement project one.